Okay. So we have been discussing uh, operators on symmetric Fox space. Okay. So we have a Hilbert space H. H should be any Hilbert space. Hilbert space. Then we constructed the gamma H, which is the symmetric Fox space. In the symmetric Fox space, we have a particular color, I mean, a collection of vectors, which are called exponential vectors. So for X in H, we have E of X in the symmetric Fox space, okay? Such that this vectors, this collection is total. Span closure of this collection is the whole of symmetric Fox space, is total in the symmetric Fox space. Okay, so and it's also independent also, but uh, for the time being, we don't need the independence. I mean, we proved that it's this set is independent, linearly independent, and it's an uncountable collection. Okay, I mean, it's not, uh, so they are linearly independent. Incidentally, I want to say something. Uh, I think I didn't say that. See, you don't need the whole of H to make it total in this. For instance, so let me do, let me, since I remember this, I will do, do this. So if S contained in H is dense, okay, then E of X, X is in S, is total. Okay. You don't need the whole thing. That is because the exponential vector, the exponentiation, exponentiation is continuous. Okay. This is clear because exponentiation is continuous because x going to e of x is continuous. Okay, continuous. So if xn converges to some x, then e of xn will converge to e of x. That's what it means. That we have proved it. We have proved this. So from this, if uh, if you have a dense subspace, okay, then you get all e of x here. Okay. Then, if you take the clo if you take the closure of e of x, I mean, uh, from x coming from s, then you get. I mean, if you have for any x in h, then you can approximate any x in h can be approximated by sequence in s. Then any e of h can be approximated by this. So because of continuity, it follows. So we have already proved this. So this is true. And the remark I want to make is actually you don't need a dense subspace of h to get a total. I mean. You, you don't need to exponentiate a dense subspace of H to get a to total set in symmetric Fox space. It is indeed true that if you take, for example, if you take, um, if, we, if uh, this is a fact, which I'm not going to prove, it's a paper actually. It's a paper by V.S. Sundar, K.S. K.R. Patsardi, and maybe Rajaram, but I don't know. Okay, V.S. Sundar plus K.R. Patsardi plus others. I mean, there is one more person. I think it's Rajaram, but so which says that if uh, if you take H is equal to L2, okay, L2, I think it's zero infinity, okay, then you take the indicator functions. You know what is indicator function? This is all those one ST where ST is an interval containing in zero infinity. Okay, then gamma, then this is I script I, okay, so then this set. E of x, where x is in this i, okay, is total. Obviously, indicator functions are not dense. You have to take linear combination of indicator function so that that will be dense in L2. Okay, L2 is all square integrable functions. Okay, so you need simple functions are dense. Indicator functions are only total there. Okay, so so you, you have a total set in L2 zero infinity. When you exponentiate that. You get a total set in gamma sh. I mean, you actually the theorem is if you have a dense subset, dense subset of uh, uh, h, then if you exponentiate it, you get a total subset in uh, symmetric Fox space. <laughs> but here you have a total set, but this is not true for all total sets. See, that is the problem. You can't prove that if you take a total set because this exponential is not a linear map. No, it's not a linear map. Even in ordinary function, exponential is not a linear map. Okay. So if you have a total set, then exponential, you, you don't expect a total set there. But for some total set, it works. Okay, And it's an open question. 
what are the uh, what kind of total sets you have to take in a hilbert space i mean what kind of sets of course it has to be total by that i mean otherwise it's not possible so what kind of total sets you have to take inside subsets you have to take inside h so that when you exponentiate it you get a total set in gamma h. this is so a subscript there is no sub one st where st is an interval indicator function of intervals oh, okay. uh, s and t where st is contained in zero and infinity. it's an interval indicator function corresponds to set no you can take just some intervals yes. okay s comma t okay s comma t is not very easy ST is contained in zero infinity. It's a okay. contained in zero infinity. You take the indicator functions of intervals. Okay. They are a total subset. So if you take all indicator functions of intervals, they form a total subset of I mean using intervals, you can get any open set, right? If you have open sets, from that you can get any set in the Borel sigma algebra. Okay, you get all indicator functions. So all indicator, I mean, these are all just I am saying you have to prove it. Okay. We take the indicator function using that you can countable union of any open set in uh, real line is un countable union of intervals. Okay. So if you take count, so you get any open set there. Once you have any open set, then you get any uh, any set in the Borel sigma algebra in the closure, again the fu function closure. You can get it. So once you have any, then by li taking linear combination, you get uh, simple functions and simple functions are then simple. So this is total. Okay. So indicator functions of intervals, if you take, you consider that, and if you exponentiate it, you get a total set in symmetric Fox space. Okay. That is not true for all total set. It, you can't expect to take a total set and then to exponentiate it, you get a total set in the symmetric Fox space. That's not possible. So it's an open question, okay. One of you can try later that to prove it's a difficult open question, of course. Okay, determine the conditions so that if you take a total set, what kind of total set will lead to total when you exponentiate, you get a total subset in the symmetric space. It's an open question. Maybe I'll write it open question. Determine the Total subsets giving rise to total subsets of gamma dot when exponentiated okay, when, when you exponentiate it you get the total subset okay. So this is an open question. Anyway, so, so now let us define the, so, but we will deal with uh, H exponential of H, H itself, okay? Only later when we want to define unbounded operators, we have to take a particular domain. Now here we can take any exponential domain. So we have a H, then span of, I'm not taking the closure, okay? Span of all E of X, X in H. I am calling this as scripty. Okay. This is what is called exponential domain. So we know this exponential domain is total. I mean, it's dense. Since I have taken span, it's dense. Okay. So on this, we can define operator. Then we can extend it to the whole of this if, if it is bounded. But since we are we are dealing with unitary, it's enough to define an exponential vector and we have to verify its itself in our products. We have already defined what is called for second quantization. So if you in this is for unitary, this u of h, script u of h is unitaries, then gamma u of uh, any e of x is defined to be just e of ux. Okay? This extends to unitary, we have saw in the last class, extends to unitary. So this is what is called second quantization of u, okay? gamma u, which we defined in the last class. This preserves the inner product, so you can extend to an unitary in the symmetric box space. This is the second quantization. Okay? This is what is called second quantization. This is second quantization of unitaries. 
There is another kind of second quantization, which you can do it for a vector, but it's also called as Weyl operators, which we are defined as follows, Weyl operators. Okay, so Weyl operators are defined as follows. Right, better. Weyl. Operators. So if you have you take a x in h, as usual, we have h and we have a symmetric fox space corresponding to that gamma of h. You take x in h. So you can define any function on the exponential domain. It need not be linear. You can define any function. And that, that function, if it preserves the inner product, then it gives rise to unity. Okay. That's what the our lemma says. The lemma we have, that's what it says. So that function can be just translation. If you have x, you can consider this function, e of y going to e of y plus x for, for all y in h. Okay, You can define this function. But then this will not preserve the inner product. For that, you have to multiply with some uh, constants. Okay, so you can verify. You can do see since you have e of if you have e of y one, e of y two, the inner product is e power y one y two. On the other hand, if you take e of y one plus x one, e of y one plus x two, you will get other terms. So you have to subtract that, and then you you get a unit. So that is what we have defined. So this is what we want to do. So we define as follows. I mean, you can write, keep it, no problem. But I'm just I want to define this. W of x. This is the this is like translation. Okay, acting on any e of x, e of y equal to. So since we want a unitary, that is, it has to preserve the norm, it has to preserve the inner product. So we do this. First, we do this. We we take we take e power minus x square. This is a number. E is the number. Okay, e power minus x square by two, and then we take this inner product with x y. This this is just number. Okay, then this is a vector y plus x. Then you translate it by this y plus x. Okay. So this is defined on exponential vectors. This ex extends to, an, to a unitary operator. Operator on gamma of h. Okay, sometime I may not put the subscript because we are only dealing with symmetric fox space. So I may just put gamma of h. Maybe I will remove it now itself. From here onwards, I will use only gamma of h for second uh, symmetric fox space. So this is the definition of Weyl operator. It is just translation. E of y going to E of y plus x, some constant time that. And that constant is added to preserve the inner product. So we want to prove this. Okay. Weyl operator, you can take this as definition. And this is the proof also. This is how Weyl operator is defined. And uh, the statement is it extends to a unitary operator. So which we want to prove. Okay, Maybe definition and uh, proposition and definition. The definition is part of the proposition. Okay, Which is also definition. This is definition of W. So proof. So we want to see whether it very, whether it, so for a fixed dx, if we are fixing a x, then we are talking about w of x, e of y1, w of x, e of y2. Okay. We want to check the inner product is preserved. So this is equal to we have e power minus x square by 2. Okay. Then e power x y1, okay, e of y1 plus x. That is what the Weyl operator is. On the other hand, here again e of minus x square by 2 minus e of x y2 e of y2 plus x, right? To calculate the inner product, which is just equal to exponential. This is a function. Since I want to write everything in the bracket, I'm writing it. x square by 2, x square by 2 will add up to x square, norm x square. This is positive. You can bring it from the inner. I mean, it's a, it's a positive number. So whether you take it from the first uh, place or second place in the inner product doesn't matter. Okay. Then that is going to be the first one is um, yeah, you want to take it out. 
the first one is conjugate linear so x y1 bar right okay. and the other one is minus x y2 okay then the inner product between y1 plus x y2 plus x okay now you get x y2 there which will cancel with that no this is plus right this is plus i have taken all the constants out first okay x square by 2 x square by 2 add up norm x square by 2 norm x square by 2 add up to norm x square okay then i have that x y1 which is in the first place and our inner product is conjugate in the conjugate linear in the first place so i have take it out as y1 x y1 which is y1 x okay then the another one is x y2 okay and then the inner product of e of y1 plus x e of y2 plus x which is that okay so now you can see that they will all they will all cancel and it is just e of y1 e of y2 I mean, it is just what remains is exponential of y1 y2 and which is this okay. so it preserves the inner product since it preserves the inner product, it extends to a unitary and So that is what we want. So this operator, which is defined on the exponential vectors and extended linearly and then by continuity to the whole of sum of it is what is, this is a unitary operator. This is what is called veil operators. For every x in h, we get a veil operator in the symmetric form space. Okay. okay. So what are the properties of the veil operators? I had a paper, I forgot to bring. It's okay. So proposition. So, I'm going to write a very important commutation relation. These veil operators, do they commute? See, the second quantization of unitaries gives a representation of unitaries. Unit, I mean, from u of h to u of h to gamma u of gamma of h. I mean, you, when you have a unitary in u of h, then you get a unitary on gamma of h, right? That is second quantization. u going to gamma of u. This respects the product that is gamma of u1, u2 equal to gamma of u1, gamma of u2. Okay. This is what is, we proved it in the last class. This is what is called representation of u1. So, okay. so this gives a representation of these unitaries. Second quantization gives a representation of unitaries. Okay. But here H is an abelian group, which is a vector space. Okay. It's an abelian group. Whether it gives a representation of the abelian group is a question. It will not give a representation. W of x times W of y will be some constant multiples of W of x plus y. This is what is called the projective representation. Okay. So we have the following commutation relation. They don't commute. The H is a abelian group, but then W of x is not an W of x is not abelian. I mean, so you know some representation theory. Have you heard it? Representation means you have a group. You can represent that group as an operator on a Hilbert space. Okay, that is what your representation is as unitary operators, mostly unitary operators. Usually it will be invertible, but then there are some theorem will say that uh, for at least for some of the nice groups, it will be a compact, locally compact or something. Okay, you will have the Peter Weil theorem will say that uh, they will all be actually unitaries and other things. Uh, so here we have here we have a Hilbert space which is not locally compact, infinite any invariant in Hilbert space. Okay, then. Actually, we will prove that there is something called irreducible representation. That is, it does not have any invariant subspace. Okay, we will prove that it does not have any invariant subspace. We will come to that. But before that, whether this gives a representation, it will not give a representation. If it's a representation, it has to, I mean, the, you, you take the group action, W of X plus Y. I mean, the, the group action in H is addition. Okay, X plus Y. Okay, W of X plus Y. The question is W of X times w of y. The question is whether it is equal to w of x plus y. Okay, It will not be equal. It will be some constant times that, which will depend on x and y. Okay. That is equal to e power minus i imaginary part of, this is what is called a symplectic form on, I mean, if you have a h cross h, you have an inner product, this is what is called a symplectic form, but we don't go through that because you can actually work with some uh, 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 some arbitrary. I mean, you the imaginary part is one such inner part, one such symplectic form, but you can work with any abstract in a symplectic form and get that. Uh, but 
let we are doing concrete concrete thing so this is equal to inner product of x y times w of x plus y this is a constant this is a number complex number right complex number of modulus one of course it has to be modulus one because what you are multiplying they are all unitaries so it cannot be it has to be complex number of modulus one okay imaginary part of x y is a real number and i times a real number you get the e power i times a real number which is a complex number of modulus one so this is the relation this is what is called canonical commutation relation okay ccr Which represents the bosons. Bosons satisfy these things. Okay. Yeah, that this kind of any if w of x term w of y equal to w of x plus y, that is a representation. W of x term w of y is some constant depending upon x y. I mean, constant time is an operator, which is which is also something. I mean, this this they don't commute. W of x and w of y don't commute. They commute up to a constant, which is not too bad. Okay, so we can handle it. So that's what that is what is a projective representation is. Not just, I mean, they are representation up to a constant. That is what projective representation is. Okay. So this is what is called canonical commutation relation. There is something called canonical anti-commutation relation that will represent fermion that can be represented on the anti-symmetric fault space. Actually, this is not this, this is not canonical commutation relation. Canonical commutation relation is for from using this veil operator, you get something called creation operator, annihilation operators. They satisfy the canonical commutation relation. Uh, but this is also, I mean, there is some Heisenberg picture. This, I mean, it, it's, uh, it depends on that. Okay. So from we will go get to that, the canonical commutation relation for uh, creation annihilation operator. But they are all unbounded operators. For that, we have to do some unbounded operator theory, and then we will get to that. For the time being, we are just doing this. Okay. So we are looking at the representation of H itself. H itself. Uh, this gives a representation of H, which is not a representation, which is a projective representation. They are they, they are representation up to a constant. Okay, W of X and W of Y, they are not equal to W of X plus Y. If you have a commutative group, okay, then an irreducible representation will be one dimension, which will be a character group, an E power something on the circuit. Which is just one dimension, it will be given by some character in one dimension. Okay. So, uh, but then here you have an infinite dimension. This will be an irreducible representation. Just by attaching this constant, we get some irreducible representation on a big uh, infinite dimensional first space. Okay? Anyway, the statement is just this W of X times W of Y equal to that. That is the statement. This is true for all X, Y. Given and x and y in H, we have defined W of x, W of y, which are operators, which are unitary operators. They satisfy this relation, commutation relation. That's what we are saying. So to verify this relation, we have to verify it on a total set. Okay. And it's enough to verify this on the exponential vectors. Okay. So let us just verify what is W of x times W of y on any E of z. Okay. Which is equal to W of x acting on e power minus norm y square by 2 minus y z okay, e of z plus y. Okay. That is equal to e power minus norm x square by 2 minus norm y square by 2 minus uh, x z mm, x times z plus y. Right? Minus y z. Okay. Then e of z plus y plus x. Correct. I have just applied successively. That's all. I have got this. Okay. On the other hand, I apply this w of x plus y on e of z. Okay. That is going to be e power minus norm x plus y square by 2. Just applying the definition. Then x plus y z. Okay. The inner product. Then e of z plus x plus y. Okay. So you get the same vector here. Just the constants are different. You have the same vector. I mean, e, e is the vector. That is a number. 
okay so e of y plus z x plus y is the vector there and you know, it differs by a constant only okay and the constant is if you expand x plus y x plus y whole square norm x plus y whole square norm x square plus norm y square plus two times real part of x y that's what you will get plus you will get so which is my minus there on the other hand you have x plus on the other hand what differs there is x z plus y there okay and y minus y z is there so when I mean, what do you have here you have x plus y z so x plus y z you have the inner product between x y is, is what is more there here what is more is the real part is more there minus of the real part so what you will what remains there is if you cancel it what remains there is just the imaginary part of it okay so if you just do the computation to cancel the terms i mean just uh, verify i mean compare these two things okay then you get that relation this relation okay that's all you work it out if you have any okay i just applied the definition and i got this that's all okay so the canonical commutation relation is satisfied by that it's better you don't need i mean if you practice it it's better okay practice with the exponential vectors and all that with this definition and uh, it will be better okay? and uh, see this definition we are using we are using the i mean the, the inner product is conjugate linear in the first variable linear in the second variable okay otherwise you have to define it as yx if it is linear in the first variable conjugate linear in the second variable here you will instead of xy here you will have yx and then inner product between yx that's what you will have it depends on the inner product I mean, that's what will give the right answer. Okay. okay. So we have got this. So now let us verify more properties of this proposition. Uh, so from this, we know that W of X, W of Y, they don't commute. So you can write it the other way. Two, ah, there is an I. Did I write? Ah, I is there. Okay, good. Okay. 2I times imaginary part of XY into w of y w of x w of x and w of y don't commute they commute up to a constant okay actually this is called uh, canonical computation relation so <laughs> whatever you can call it anything that implies this this implies that and the uh, second whatever we are going to, to uh, get in terms of creation annihilation operator that also satisfy that also follows from this okay it's all the same thing okay so this is one which is clear I don't have to prove it, which is clear. Then the second is if you apply gamma u, u in u of h, you have it mm -hmm. take a unitary and you have x in h, okay, then for all, okay, then gamma gamma of u, okay, w, this is what is called conjugation, okay, conjugating by unitary. If you have any unitary, then you can ut u star. This is conjugation by the unitary. Okay. You can write it. I mean, if you want an isomorphism of B of H, we have a H is a Hilbert space, then B of H is a algebra. If you want a nice isomorphism, which preserves an arm continuous, and all isomorphism will look like ut u star. You can prove it later. Okay. If you have an isomorphism, then you can actually get it. Okay. But I mean, we, I will not get into this because we don't need it. I'm just telling you if you are interested in operator algebras. So, so this is just one such isomorphism of B of B of the symmetric Fox space. On its symmetric Fox space, you can write this. No, you can you can take any unitary and do you can do this gamma of u star. Okay, under this isomorphism, what happens? Isomorphism means it preserves a product. Everything. I mean, isomorphism. Huh? No, no, no. T is any operator. Any operator in TFH, you can write it like that. That's what I'm saying. No, it's not translation. I'm just saying that that conjugation, whatever, conjugation by gamma of u gives this, gives just an action on this, W of ux. So it's very nice. U is a unitary. See, automorphism of any object is any bijection which preserves the uh, action on that. I mean, preserves the product or sum or whatever. Okay, it's a homomorphism also. Okay, so preserves the, the structure. All the structures you have. And in Hilbert space, you have inner product, you have addition, you have, you have everything is preserved by what is called unitary. Okay, 
Okay, so you have a unitary is an action on the Hilbert space. If you take gamma of u, that gives an action on all these wave operators. That action, these two actions are intertwined. That's what this is. Okay, so you you can consider x going to w of u x. That gives an action on the wave operators. Okay, that actually will extend to an action on the whole thing. So which is given by this gamma u w of x gamma u star. This is true for all x. For all x and for u. That's what we have said. So this is another thing which will prove. Okay. Okay, we'll prove that. This is very easy to prove. So one is clear. So two. So we just have to apply that definition. Gamma of u, w of x, gamma of u star acting on any e of y. Okay. Which is equal to gamma of u, w of x, e of u y, u star y. Right. Ah, incidentally, gamma of u star, gamma of u whole star, notice, gamma of u whole star is equal to gamma of u star. That is because gamma preserves the product. Okay. So u u star equal to 1. Gamma of u star equal to 1, equal to u star u. Okay, because it's unitary. So then you take the gamma, then it is gamma of 1, which is equal to gamma of this. So this is equal to gamma of u, gamma of u star, right? So gamma of u star, I mean, this is gamma of u, gamma of u star. Gamma of unitary, so something is equal to gamma of 1 is 1. Gamma of 1 acting on me, it's 1, identity. Okay. It's, it's a representation. So gamma of u whole star is gamma of u star. Star is just the inverse for unitary. Okay. So gamma of u whole star is gamma of u star. Okay. So just. Okay. So because of that, we have this. We have just this. this. So I, I whether I put the star out or in, inside doesn't matter. Okay. <clears throat> now that is equal to gamma of u acting on. So, we just have to, have to get a product. e power minus x square by 2 okay, minus x u star y okay, e of u star y plus x. Okay. Now, you apply gamma of u. That first two, whatever you have in the initially is just a constant. Okay, it's just a number. So, which is just equal to e power minus, but then norm of u x square equal to norm of u x square because u is unitary. Right? So, you can put u x square by 2 if you want. Okay? And then u star, you can bring it here. Right? u x y, you can write it. Then e of u, u star y plus u x. I'm just applying gamma of u instead. Instead of norm x square, I have written u x square. Both are same because u is unitary. And the u star, I have brought it here. And then I am applying gamma of u on that. If you apply gamma of u, the first part is just constant. So it is go just going to act inside uh, the exponential vector. It is going to act by u. If you act u, u star, it, you will get. u star is 1 for unitary. So you get e power minus norm of u x square by 2 minus u x y. Okay, e of y plus ux, which is precisely equal to w of ux, which is the definition. By definition, this is equal to w of ux. Okay. okay. So we have proved this. Gamma of u, w of x, gamma of u star equal to w of ux. Okay, so there are more properties. Should remember one by one. Okay, you know what is semi direct product of groups, two groups? If you have G1, a group, and if you have another group, G2, then you can take the cross product and define group action, which is just G1, G2, and some G3, G4. You can just multiply coordinate ways. That is what is called. 
direct product of two groups. On the other hand, there is something called semi-direct product. What is semi-direct product is you have a group G1 and you have another group which acts on this G1 as automorphisms. Okay. G2, there is an alpha from G2 to G1. That is alpha of G2 acts on this G1 is some something, some number. Alpha of G1 is I mean alpha of G2 gives in automorphism. Sorry. Automorphism of G. For each G in G2, you have an automorphism. That is, the G2 is represented as automorphism. You can represent I mean, any representation is just you take anything, you represent it on some as automorphism. If you have a set, it is just bijection. That is automorphism. If you have a set, then the bijections are the automorphism. If you have a group, it is a bijection, which, which are also homomorphisms. They are the automorphs. If you have a vector space, then it is bijection, which are also inverted. If it is inner product space, it is bijection, which are also, I mean, which preserves inner product, which are unitaries. If it is algebra, then it has to preserve the algebra. I mean, it has to preserve the structure. That is what is called automorphism. Okay? So here you have a group. So it, it is just automorphism of the group, bijective homomorphs. Okay? So you have a bijective homomorphism for each G, for each element in G2, you have an automorphism on that. You have represented this G2 on that. Okay. Now you can define G1, G2. Okay. Mm, G1, G2, and G1 prime, G2 prime. Okay. You can define the product to be G1 alpha G2 of G1 prime times G, G2, G2 prime. I mean, it's just G2 goes past that by an alpha. You have to go, I mean, it is like you can just take the product like this, G1, G2, get a product. You can forget about the bracket. There is no bracket. Okay. Then G2 has to cross over that. Okay. To cross over that, it takes an alpha G2. You can take, write it as G2, G1. You can write it like this, G2. This is like this. G, you can, without pro, I'm just writing without product. This is the actual definition G1, G2. Then you have G1 prime, G2 prime. Okay. I will erase this. I'm just for your, I mean, just to imagine, I'm just telling you G1. Then you have G2 and G1 prime, and you put a G2 inverse G2 here. Then G2 prime. Okay. This is like alpha G2 of G1 prime. Okay. I mean, just writing the product, I mean, okay. Just to remember, this is like alpha G2 of G1 prime. Okay. So through this action, to have this product, okay, you define the product through this action. So you have a G1 and you have a G2 which acts on this, then that is what is called semi this this kind of if you take this kind of product, this is not direct product. This is what is called G1. G1. I mean G1. G2 through alpha. As a set, this is just G1 cross G2 only as a set. As set. Only as product if the product is defined by this. This is the definition of the product. Product is defined through the action. Okay. This is just for your, you don't have to remember all that. Okay. The reason is you can take U of H, which is a group. Okay. H, which is a group. U of H is unitary. Unitaries are acting as automorphism on H. Okay. So you can talk about H of U of H. This is a group. This group will look like some U, U. Okay. Where U in H and U in U of H. This is how it will look like. This is a direct product of these two things. Okay. So you can have a semi direct product. What you have this now, you you consider this man u u going to w of u gamma of u. Okay, this is in B of I mean unitaries, in fact. Unitaries in gamma of h. Okay, this gives a representation of the semi direct part 
how how does it give you consider this u u u1 u1 times u1 u2 you want to take the product i mean you have represented it like this okay i mean what i am saying is this map you want to you can call this map as w of this i mean w of u u is equal to w of u times gamma of u just the definition i mean w of u we have defined w of small u and capital u i'm just defining it like that okay. hmm? then w of let us consider the product w of u u u1 u1 w of u2 u2 okay if we just take that is just w of u1 gamma of u1 then w of u2 gamma of u2 okay and we know that this is equal to w of u1 we can write it as gamma of u1 w of u2 gamma of u1 star gamma of u1 okay you can write it like this then gamma of u2 okay and now you know that this is equal to w of u1 this gamma of this this one is just the action w of u1 u2 okay then gamma of u1 gamma of u2 okay now ah this doesn't exactly give a, i mean there is one something more now this is not exactly equal to that this is equal to minus imaginary part i i come to that imaginary part of uh, u1 u1 u2 times w of u1 plus u1 acting on u2 times gamma of u1 u2 okay which is equal to e power minus i imaginary part of u1 u1 u2 okay times whatever we have w of u1 plus u1 u2 u1 u2 Well, it doesn't give a representation of the semi-direct product also. Up to a constant, it gives. Okay, What it gives is the following. If you have, this is a circle. Circle. This is equal to all those z such that mod z equal to 1. Complex numbers. Okay. Cross h. Cross unitary of h. Now, we can define a new product on this. Okay. Where this z u u okay z1 u1 u1 z2 small u2 u2 okay the product is z1 times z2 times e power i imaginary part of u1 u1 u2 okay this is this is the number then the second second coordinate in the direct product is u1 plus u1 u2 u1 u2 if you define this as the product if you only consider the second one there is a the, the semi-direct product but you have another semi-direct product there is an action of the hilbert space also okay this kind of this is how the product is defined say i am taking the cross product of circle in the complex plane cross product with h cross product with u of h i am defining a product like this okay then this gives a representation of the group. That, that is what is called Heisenberg group, usually. And mostly, H is finite dimensional for the purpose, it will be. Okay. That is what is called a Helberg Heisenberg group. Okay. And uh, that's a well known group which is whose harmonic analysis has been well studied and all that. Okay. And this gives a represent, and this is the this is how it is represented. Heisenberg group is represented on the top space. Okay. Anyway, so what we have is we have uh, something, we have a second quantization of unitaries, we have whale operators, and the product is like this. They satisfy this relation. It all follows from this relation, whatever I have written here. Gamma of u, w of x, gamma u star, w of ux. And the whale relation, w of x, w of y equal to this. These two relations, then you can take any product and write the, the, the okay? So this is just two. I mean, these are all gem 
it's just tautology. There is really anything new in this. You can write it in different form. It preserves the group structure. I mean, there is nothing. There is nothing new about all this. Okay, I am just saying the same thing in different language. That's all. Okay, that's all. Okay. So there is further more. So what what have we done? We know. So I have defined this. Okay. Okay, that's all. Next, uh, there is a continuity. I defined strong topology last time. Okay, if you have, I mean, some T n contained in B of H. Okay, then T n converges to T strongly. If T n x, T n z converges to T z for all z in H. I defined this. Okay, last time the strong topology. I mean, whenever we define representation, we have to worry about the continuity also. Okay. So this group, this representation is strongly continuous. This u, u going to, this is in h cross u of h going to w of u, u, which we defined as this, which is equal to w of u, gamma of u, okay, which is by definition, is strongly continuous. I leave it as an assignment. We have already seen. We have proved that exponential vectors are strongly continuous. Okay. I sorry, exponential vectors are continuous. I mean, that's not strong. That's not they are not operators. They're just vectors. Xn converges to x, e of xn and converges to e of x. Okay. Now suppose you act all those things. Okay. Now small u n converges to small u, u n converges to you have to prove that this is assignment. What you have to prove is the following: u n converges to u u n converges to u strongly. This is also strongly. This is in the vector space. I mean, this is in the Hilbert space. Okay, so this is in norm. Norm in the Hilbert space. This converges strongly. Then w of u n u n converges to w of u u strongly. Strongly means on any point it has to converge. And I told you for unitaries, if you have uniformly bounded subsets, or if the sequence is uniformly bounded, then strong convergence, did I give that as an assignment? I don't remember. That the strong convergence, it is enough to see if Tn, if not, you take that also as assignment, okay? I don't know whether I said it, assignment. I said you have to... Um, uh, uh, I mean, if Tn converges to T strongly, is equivalent to saying Tn xi converges to T xi for all xi in S plus S contained in H is total. Okay. It's enough to have, the, I mean, strong convergence in Tn xi converges to T xi for all xi in H. It's enough to have this convergence for a total set. Of course, if it is converges for a total set, it will go take, I mean, it, it will be it's true for linear combination of that. I mean, that is its converges for the span of that. Uh, but then uh, you can extend to the whole thing by doing some epsilon by three trick, as I said. Ah, provided Tn is uniformly good. Sorry. Supremum of norm Tn is less than infinity. Provided this is true. But here we have all unitaries. So you have to use this in the appropriate assignment. Give you an example of uh, sequence of operators which converge strongly but don't converge in operator norm. Strongly but not converge in operator norm. Mm. Immediately, okay. I mean, you have to take some. Let us define Tn of any z equal to. I want to take some. Um, okay. Then z n will go to where en is an orthonormal basis. Okay. Then xi en, for e, this will go to zero. Okay. 
on the other hand norm tn z equal to norm z z na tn en for example equal to norm en norm en which is equal to 1 right which is equal to 1 so norm of tn so this implies norm of tn equal to 1 no, no, that will not go to zero. Norm of TN is equal to one. That cannot go to zero. Okay, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Here is an example. Okay, this is a very simple example. There are many examples. This is an immediate example. Okay, so this goes to zero. TN Z goes to zero because Z and the, that's a tail part of the. If you take any orthonormal basis, the net product with the orthonormal basis will go to zero because this is true. No, the summation of Z and over square is equal to z norm z itself norm z square itself okay there's a what, what is called fourier series expansion of any orthogonal basis it's called fourier series okay just name okay. so so z n has to go to zero because it's summable okay but on the other hand if you take i mean but in, in norm it doesn't convert best example is the projections okay. best example is projections You take any orthonormal basis, okay, H, T, any infinite dimension. Of course, infinite dimensional, everything coincides. Strong topology, weak topology, all those things coincide. Finite dimensional, there is no problem, okay. This is an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, okay. Then let En, I mean, you can take any, any projection, but here I'm you taking something specific. This is an orthonormal basis, N equal to 1 to infinity, okay. Then you define Pn from H to span. This is just finite span, finite uh, dimension, E1 up to Ea. Okay. This is a finite rank projection. The range is finite. Okay. Then Pn verify. This is an exercise. Shall I give assignment? Okay. <laughs> this is an exercise. Maybe I will write it as assignment. Okay. This is important. Sorry, third assignment. Three assignments I have given. Okay. Third assignment. Verify that Pn converges to identity strongly. That is clear, no? You don't need to. That is clear. But our norm Pn equal to 1. Okay, norm Pn equal to 1. So Pn so Pn minus 1 does not go to 0. Does not go to 0. Sorry, norm Pn equal to 1. 1 minus Pn is also a projection, right? Pn equal to 1, 1 minus Pn, which is also a projection, which is a projection onto the orthogonal complement of that. Okay. So that also has norm 1. So this cannot go to 0. So Pn does not converge to 1 in norm, but it converges strongly. You can you verify that it converges strongly. Okay. Just to convince yourself. You take any vector, it converges strongly on that. It's very easy. It's a two line. Okay? Just write it. So th this this is the most important example projections. Okay. This is a, it's such an obvious thing, but when you ask, I have to think. Okay. So, it comes everywhere. Okay, so this is an example. Okay, so what have we proved? We so the assignment is this veiled representation, whatever the representation we have from you that is strongly continuous. Okay, that's so what you. Ah, it is separable to infinite dimension. Yeah. I'm taking countable. We deal with only separable in world space. Non-separable, we are not dealing with. Okay. Okay. So that was uh, a, a assignment. Okay. What is the final thing? Final. So I thought I can start unbounded operators, but I may not have time. Anyway, let us see. This is the this is how I mean this is the intuition for you to do unbounded operator theory. So this veil, veil, see this u going to w of u. This is what is a projective representation. This is not a representation, which is a projective representation. That is, if you have u1, u2, okay, then u1 plus u2, w of u1 plus u2 is equal to e of imaginary part, i times imaginary part of u1, u2, 
means w of u1 may be plus here. The I mean, it will be the other way, w of u2. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the e comes the other way. So here I'm putting a plus. Okay. This is what we have. But if u1, the inner product between u1 and u2 is real, that constant is not there. Right? W of u, W of v equal to W of v times W of u. Okay. Or you can put a 2 here. 2 here. And then write it like this. W of u1, W of u2 equal to W of u2, u1. Where you have a w two a times that okay so but if w of u w of e equal to w of e w of e if the inner product between u v is real is in is a real number okay in particular w of t u u h b fixed you fix a vector in h and you take t u the T coming from R. You just take the real subspace generated by U. Okay, you take T U. Okay, this is a abelian group. Group. That is W of T U, W of S U equal to W of S U T U. I mean, W of S plus T U. Okay. It satisfies this. It's a representation of this Amir. It's a representation of R. Person abelian group. Is a is a abelian group. Is it also it's a representation, is a representation of R. R as an abelian group, additive group, R plus. Okay. R plus. It's a representation of R plus. Okay. So, how do you think it will look like? If you have a, see, if you have a function f from r to r or c, if you want, whatever, if you, if, or anywhere in the real thing, f of s times f of t equal to f of s plus t. Then what is f? f is continuous. Actually, measurable is enough. f is measurable is enough. But let's assume f is continuous. Do you know what is f? What happened? Then exactly. If f of s plus t equal to f of s plus f of t, then that is going to be linear. Mm -hmm. okay, that is f of I mean that's given by some ct. It's just a linear function, monomial with no constant coefficient. Okay. So then there exists a c in R such that f of s equal to e power ct. Okay. In particular, if you have a homomorphism of R into circle, then it will look like e power ict. Okay. So if you have a homomorphism or, a, I mean, or an isomorphism, a representation of R on anything, that should also look like some sort of exponentiation. Okay. Here we have it's a unitary operator, right? W of S U, where S is in R. Okay. This satisfies this condition. W of S plus T U equal to W of S U plus W of T U. Okay. Then, because it satisfies this condition, I mean, it's a general statement. Okay. This is just a statement. Which we will be proving. Okay. If U T T in R is an abelian group. I mean, R is a representation of let's say it's not even that. Let's say this is this satisfies the following U S plus T equal to U S U T. Then there exists a self-adjoint operator. 
such that you t and it's strongly continuous. It needs to be continuous. I mean, this is we will prove later. I have to make sense what is the Selper Chand operator. It's not usual Selper Chand operator, it's an unbounded operator. Okay. Then u t is equal to exponential of i a so exponential operator a such that i a t. T is a number, a is an operator. So you have one single operator which determines this group. U t is a group. This is not just for whale operator. This is true for any any operator, any seven, any group of operators, any abelian group, any group of I mean any one parameter group, okay, any one parameter group, a group uh, indexed by R, U U S plus T equal to U S U T. Then U T looks like e power I A T. You have to make sense of what is e power. You can make sense by using that summation if you want. I mean, e power a equal to identity plus a, a plus a square by 2. You can make sense. That will converge. Because you take the norm of that, that will absolutely converge in a Banach space, so it will converge. Using that, you can prove that. I mean, if, if, if in a Banach space, if you have an absolutely convergent, absolutely mean norm with respect to norm. You have some sequence in Banach space. You have a series. Summation Zayn. Okay, summation norm Zayn is smaller than infinity. Then summation Zayn as a, as, a, as a series. In the usual norm, it will exist in a Banach space. So summation A and I mean summation so something. So you can always make sense of E power A. E power an operator. Okay, E power T. You can make sense of identity plus T plus T square by 2 plus T cube by 3 factorial. You can define it like this. Because you take this summation 1, number 1, plus norm t, plus norm t square by 2 factorial. This will converge to e power norm t, right? So, absolutely convergent. So, it will converge. This will converge anyway. In norm. So, you can make sense of e power t all the way, anywhere. So, it is precisely that. Okay. So, e power iat, you can make sense. But A, what is A? But A will not be a bounded operator. So that is why you need to do something. A is an unbounded operator. A is a self adjoint unbounded operator. So this is why we need unbounded operator theory here. Self adjoint unbounded operator. So uh, mostly. If it is if ut is norm continuous in T, in T, T n converges to T, then U T n converges to T. If Tn converges to T, Utn converges to Ut in norm, then it is bounded. If and only if, then it is bounded. If this doesn't happen, it will be unbounded. Okay. So you have to study the unbounded operator theory. So if it has a, if it is a norm, see, it, it's only the Ut, I mean, Ut is a one parameter group. It depends on the continuity of it. And the uh, nice thing is, if it is continuous at zero, it continues everywhere. That is because u u t naught is equal. I mean u u t plus t t naught plus t is just u t naught of u t, right? Because other if it is continuous at zero, it is continuous at any point. Okay, it is just u t naught u t n converges to one. T n goes to zero. U t n converges to one. Okay, then U T N plus T naught will converge to U T naught. Okay, so so it's enough to consider any any of the point, any one of the point. It's continuous at one point. It's continuous everywhere. Okay, so if you have a strongly continuous, strongly continuous thing, then there exists an unbounded operator such U T equal to E for I A T, which we will prove. First, we will define unbounded operators. We will define the unbounded operator theory. Then we will prove this. Okay. Then we will differ. This is what is called a generator or differentiating. You differentiate e power iat and get a, of course. If you differentiate it and evaluate at zero, you get a, right? Or you get ia, right? So this is for so you have to differentiate it. So for that, uh, for that, we will do the unbounded operator theory and we'll come back to this. Okay, we'll start unbounded operator theory in the next class.